This is Rosie. And you see we're buddies now. This is, uh, <laughs> this is our roadmap, to, Rosie's roadmap to success. I'm gonna probably let her down in a sec. We just wanna start off with the dog here. Oh, okay. All right, all right, there we go. So we're not gonna force. We're gonna let her kind of do her own thing. So basically in this session, uh, I could tell immediately she had a lot of cord still in her blood when I first came in the uh, door. Sit. Sit. I used to do something called an uh, introductory video where we filmed that. I should have done it because the before and after, you would be, you'd be amazed that she's not barking up a storm because she's a power barker. So, but uh, what I did, the first thing is that I took her out for a walk. Um, I fitted her up with a martingale collar. Now for the guardian, I want to give her a couple tips for this uh, so she can use this. So the martingale collar, I'd probably just keep attached to your leash and just use it only, uh, same thing with a, like a harness. What you do is you slide it over the dog's head and there's two loops. The one the dog's head goes in and there's a small one and the small one is where the leash attaches. You want to spin that around so it's back here on her spine. You're going to take the leash and you're going to run it behind her front legs, right in her armpits, in front of both, uh, behind both front legs. Then you're going to go through the loop, always thread the, the, the leash through the small hole towards the dog's head, never towards the dog's butt. That way we have the benefit of two points of contact like a harness because it's here and here. And it also takes all the tension off the dog's neck. This is what most humane societies use. This is what I refer to as special twist and leash in my write-ups. Um, we want to use this, as, and I fitted the collar specifically so she won't be able to pop her head off as long as we don't adjust it. And because we're going to have guests taking her for walks, as I described in the above video, we want to make sure that the dog doesn't get loose because if that happens, she's not going to come back to the guest. She's going to be in a panic state, and she, we don't know where she's going to go. We need to make sure we keep the dog safe. Now, the video above is going to have all sorts of tips and suggestions about helping a dog uh, feel more comfortable and relaxed uh, uh, with new people. Now, I said I wanted the guardian to try to, uh, to goal. They're going on vacation in a couple weeks, and she's going to go uh, away. Uh, she's going to go stay in a place. Uh, so what I'd like the guardian to do is try to set a goal for, I mean, it's two weeks from now, right? So maybe let's try to, let's try to set a goal. We'd like to have at least 10 guests come by before she goes off. That's a lot, but we could try, probably get two or three of our neighbors or you know, maybe five of our neighbors, which would be pretty quick. And then you know, go through your Rolodex, your phones, the people you haven't seen for a while. Hey, I haven't, I haven't had anybody over because my dog was barking like crazy. Mm -hmm. I had this guy from Dog Gone Problems come over and he's really helped, but now I need to practice and I haven't seen you forever. So can you, I got a bottle of wine, can you come on over and we'll uh, you know, chat a little bit about it. Um, and then they're gonna come over, they're gonna take the dog for a walk, they have them watch this video, the video above before so they know kind of what to do and just follow the instructions there. With enough repetition of this positive reinforcement, take changing the environment, all the other benefits I talked about in the above video, she's eventually going to feel more and more relaxed around new people and then actually look forward to new people coming over. I'm pretty sure in her mind when people come over, she thinks it's an invasion and she is the only line of defense in this house. Now, the reason that she has that perception, she really had no rules. She was able to tell the guardians when to pet her. And because of her behavior on her walks, her guardians have not been exercising her on the walks because she just, it's embarrassing. Um, now she barked a little bit on the way, but after when I was walking her, I got maybe two or three houses and she kind of stopped the barking and then she was kind of all over the place. Now let, when you're doing it, have the person let her kind of go wherever they want, except for don't let her stop. We want to keep momentum going. And if you're walking, there's, a, if there's people, or there's construction, tell them not to walk in that direction. Um, and then follow the rest of the instructions there. Now uh, to help, sit, sit. Remember, don't say it more than once. Just say it once and then make it happen. I manipulated her with the treat that time. Now, because uh, basically she thinks she's in charge of everything, so to help her get over this, um, we want to flip the leader follower dynamic. And I find there's a number of ways to do that. I like to do it with a whole lot of different little things. So the, little, the thing is so small, the dog doesn't really protest that much about it. But when we have a whole bunch of these little things going on, they really add up. So basically the first uh, rule that I suggest is not being allowed the furniture, which is kind of a wish the guardian has right now, but she kind of does it anyways. So um, I would say no furniture for at least 30 days or as long as the problem's still going on and then furniture with an invitation only. Now I didn't show the guardian this uh, uh, during the session, so I'm gonna just explain it here. I like to teach dogs directional commands. The way that I do that is that let's say we're in a door, let's say that this is the, uh, a bedroom and the hallway is out here and here's the doorway. Rosie. What I do is I bring the dog over to me, I let him know that I have a treat, and I toss the treat right outside the, into the hallway. Out. When the dog goes and licks it up, I say the word out. Then the dog comes back, Rosie, and I tr do it again. Out. All right, you can come back to me. So whenever you're using treats, remember the tre they should hear the command word right after the treat goes in the dog's mouth. So for the directional commands, what I would do is go to each room in the house, have one of the high value treats I've given you, and tear them in half, 
toss one out, let her go out and get it, say out, let her come back and do it a second time, and go to a different place. Do that especially in your kitchen and especially the area that you eat from. We wanna help her practice a new behavior which is leaving the kitchen or leaving the area where we eat because those are two rules she's not allowed to be there. So if we do it all by you know, taking or correcting, then it's all negative. But if we do this, just toss the treats, after a while you say, out, she like runs out of the room gleefully and she's like, I'm out, where's my reward? Now I do the same thing for, uh, for, uh, for uh, uh, furniture. If she's on the furniture, I touch her nose with the treat and toss it off the ground. When she gets down, and don't say, here, come and get the treat, let her find it on her own. When she gets off, say the word out, uh, off, excuse me. And so now we've used, given her a motivation to get down. That's more of a positive way of doing it, like I said, as opposed to forcing or correcting or punishing. It's just things that I don't like to do. Uh, let me see, other rules, um, I'm gonna make her, uh, I'd like the guardian to make her sit before we let her outside. Now we're not gonna force her, we're not gonna tell her, we're not gonna get angry. The way that I really work as a dog behaviorist is I try to put the dog in stage scenarios where the dog can do a number of things, but not everything at once. And I make I take away a lot of the stimulus, a lot of distractions so the dog can focus. And then when the dog does the thing that I want, boom, immediately they get a reward. So the rule is she has to sit before I let her out of the door. So if I go to the door and I tell her to sit, I count to three in my head. If she doesn't sit by the time I turn to three, turn around and walk away, sit down, pull out your phone, play words with friends, do whatever your game is, or check emails. When you get done, or after one minute, go back to the door and tell her again. Don't ask, tell her. She doesn't sit this time, walk away for two minutes, then for four minutes, then for eight minutes. And as soon as you go over there and tell her to sit, she sits, you open that door like there's remote control on her butt. After a while, she'll go sit at the door as her way of asking to go out. Now, she has some accents in the house. And in the house, when she had the accents, they weren't really accents. I think she was almost doing a little bit of marking. And she does hump. And remember, anything a dog is doing when we pet it is what we're amplifying and reinforcing. I'm thinking that what's happened over the year is the guardian, every time the dog barks or gets upset, the guardian either yells to be quiet and the dog thinks now we're both barking, or the guardian picks the dog up to keep it from running away, which is a reward, or she pets the dog to try to soothe and placate the dog, and that amplifies it. So all of these things have been, this has been kind of getting progressively worse and worse because we've been unintentionally doing things that have contributed to the problem. Now that the guardian knows not to do those things, we should start accelerating our progress in a rehabilitation rate a lot faster. Now, uh, for potty training, is a, uh, I, uh, right now the guardian says, I think you won't go outside or something like that to go potty, which is too many words. Commands for dogs should be one word commands. It should be a unique word that you don't hear very often other than that command word. And uh, we also have a tendency to, baby, uh, to caveman or baby talk. Go potty, good that, bad this. And dogs key in the first sound that they hear typically. So the, and the more words we use, the harder it is for them to understand. So one of the things I told the guardian to do is keep a list of all the designated command words and use only one command. Not come, come here, over here, here girl, dog's name, whistle. No, just come. And so we tell each other and remind me if I forget later on what the watchwords were and I'll go through all the watchwords at once. Um, all right, so um, for the potty, we want to just create uh, dogs going through association, repetition, and good timing. So we have three seconds to correct or reward the dog for them to have the ability to make the connection. Now the guardian, she's, also, she's like, almost asleep with her head up. I love when dogs do that. She's exhausted, it's been mm -hmm. three hours. Um, now, the old uh, body training method was if the dog has an accent, you rub the dog's nose in or bring the dog over to it and you know, point at it. It doesn't work. Anything negative, for, especially for potty training, is not gonna work for a dog. Now, uh, so what we wanna do is exclusively use positive for reinforcement. So when we take her outside on a walk, every time she pees, we wanna say the word business or whatever the word is you want and try to come up with a fun word. Maybe say deposit, whatever you want. And as soon as the dog starts to pee or poop, we say the word deposit one time within three seconds of them starting. Then I have a treat with me, probably, preferably the high value treats I have. As soon as she gets done, within that three seconds of her finishing, I pop the treat in her mouth and I say the word deposit a second time. If we do that every time she potties, after a while she's like, I will not waste my urine on the carpet because this is valuable stuff that gets me good tasty treats if I do it outside. And after a while, if you say deposit, and she'll go like this, and you know that's a yes. If you say deposit and she just looks at you, then you know that's a no. Right now she gets the guardian up at four in the morning and then she wants to go out and just eat grass. Well, that's a way of soothing a tummy, but she probably cannot wait, uh, lift the, uh, wait for the guardian. Sit, oh, would you forget? Yes, that was a good one. I almost forgot. Um, so let me see. Uh, uh, so for potty training, just use just the command word, no rubbing the dog's nose in or leading it towards it. And if they do have an accident in front of you, slap the wall, drop a book or something to get the dog distracted and then immediately take it outside. Now the three times the dog's most likely to have an accident are right after waking up, five minutes after eating, and 15 minutes after playtime. So we should just take the dog out every time for those periods of time and also try to take her out on a regular basis. 
Now she's tethered out in front because we don't have, we're on a golf course, we don't have any backyard uh, or fenced in yard, but we probably should do that only when she's supervised. Because um, if he's out there barking at people, she's practicing that. Same thing with going to a relative's house that she likes to go at. She like runs around the backyard barking at all the neighbor dogs. It's a way of burning energy for her, but it's not the healthiest way to do it. And she's practicing behavior we don't want her to do. So if that's the case, we want to probably bring her back inside and wait for those neighbor dogs to be outside and put her back out then so she can enjoy being off leash without practicing nuisance behaviors. Uh, let me see, what else? Uh, the guardian needs to make sure she's eating something before she feeds the dog. It doesn't have to be your actual meal, that's preferable. But right now she is free fed, and for dogs, eating is one of the most important activities. So if we just simply eat something in front of the dog, so eating five or more bites, it could be a chip, a cracker, a carrot, a piece of celery, a peanut, whatever it is, it has to be a solid food. It can't be a liquid or coffee. They don't understand that as a, as a food item. But if you don't eat in front of the dog, they're like, why should I listen to you? You don't, have a, you don't even have eating privileges. So I eat first. Then I put food in the bowl and I invite the dog to come over and I'm going to use passive training to teach the dog the command word. So when she takes her first bite of food, say feast, chow, grub, supper, whatever you want to say. For the first two months, every time she takes that first bite of food, she hears supper. After I say supper, she'll know that means permission to eat her food. Now, as soon as she, if she goes sniffs the bowl and walks away, as soon as she walks more than five feet away from the bowl, whether she, there's, food, if there's any food left in it, we pick up the bowl, we dump the empty food out of it, and we put the empty bowl back down. Now we have a baby that's in the house that likes to sometimes go to the bowl, so we probably, grandma probably wants to clean that. Wait for the dog to go, because 99% of the time they'll go and lick the bowl. Wait for her to lick it and move away, then pick it up, wash it, and put it back on the floor so if the kid gets into it, it's okay. There's no food there, so there's no reason for her to guard the food. She's not doing that, but we wanna make sure that that doesn't become a problem. And then I, every time she walks by the bowl, she recognizes there's no food here. There's no food here, there's no food here. <gasps> there's food, and that's a special time. She should be fed at least twice a day. I feed my dogs three times a day, if possible, that's preferable. Um, the smaller meal, we can feed them more often. They don't have to can go, uh, stretch their stomach and they don't have to eat so much later on in life to feel full. Uh, let me see, what else? Um, uh, um, when we're playing fetch, again, look for ways to delay gratification. So when she brings the ball back, tell her to sit. Only after she sits do we throw the ball again. So again, we wanna create uh, respect for listening to the guardian uh, as a way of getting things. Now, uh, the, the kennel is right now right up uh, against the door, which is really a ba uh, the front door, and there's a window that looks out the door, and the dog can look out the kennel and probably spends all day long barking at people when, he, when she's left here alone. We wanna move the kennel in an area that we hang out in, but not right next to the door, because the dog can get confused and thinking that it's its job, and I'm pretty sure that's what she thinks is her job is to protect her humans, and that kind of reinforces that. So we move it to a different location, uh, you know, where, you know, it's a room that you hang out in, but she can be in there and relax and not have the ability to look out in the street. Now, we do have kids uh, in the house, so we want to make sure we tell the kids that when she, Rosie goes into her kennel, she is safe. We cannot entice her to come out. We cannot talk to her or pet her or anything. Uh, she gets along great with the kids. She humps them, which we don't like. We need to disagree with that. But we want the, kid, uh, the dog to know, especially when the kids want to play and she doesn't want to engage, that if I go in my kennel, I'm safe. Otherwise, I've read case study after case study of dogs who have nipped and bitten children because the children won't listen to the dog, keep on grabbing the dog, the dog's like, I'm overly tired, and now I'm cranky, I nip you, well now we get labeled as a bad dog. It's really not a bad dog, it's just a child that didn't have the right boundaries. So that should be a safe zone for the, child, for the dog. Uh, let me see, we also went over petting with a purpose and passive training. Petting with a purpose is, right now she comes up and nudges or jumps up on her guardian or scratches at her when she wants attention. Well, anything where a dog is doing when we're petting it is reinforcing. So we certainly don't want to do that when she's excited or nervous or anxious or fearful. Or really at any time she demands it because that reinforces and tells her that yes, the human thinks that you're in charge of her. So what we do instead is next time that she uh, jumps up or anything like that, uh, we tell her, give her a counter order, tell her to sit. When she sits, pet her under her chin, not never on top of the head. Pet her under the chin because when a dog feels good, its nose is in the air. Pet her under the chin and just say the word sit. If she's already sitting, ask her to lie down. Ask her to come and sit over here. She has to do something to change her state uh, to, uh, to get that attention. Now, after a while, what will happen is she's gonna come and sit in front of the garden to prepay for attention. When she does that, make sure we recognize and pet the dog for doing that. Do we have a message, weird message coming up or anything? Uh-uh. Okay. Nope, cool. just switching hands. Okay, you just literally had a weird look on your face. So oh, no. Nope. Sure. Sometimes I run out of space. Oh, okay. Um, okay, so um, now when she does prepay for attention, make sure we recognize that, because uh, like I said, uh, or off camera, a lot of us train our dogs to misbehave, because that's the easiest way to get our attention. For dogs, attention itself is rewarding and validating, even if it's angry or correcting attention. So uh, the other thing that I do is what I call passive training. Passive training is waiting for the dog to do something we want, and then rewarding them within that three second window. So every time the dog comes to you, you should pet the dog and say, come. Every time it sits next to you, you pet it and say, sit. 
Here we go. Come. So she came, something good happened. And then she gets to go off and do her own thing. Um, so uh, let me see, she, uh, she is sad at her guardian's feet. And eventually the dog will start offering these desired behaviors to get our attention instead of barking or jumping or biting or nipping or whatever it is. Um, now I went through the four escalating consequences for the guardian to disagree with unwanted actions and behaviors. If you can't remember what those are, message me or uh, text me and I can help you with those. Now, uh, because we have two people in the house, um, we want to help because we won't realize how often we're, we're doing things that reinforce what we don't want. So, um, and oh, one last, uh, before I get to that, remember anytime that she flips over on her back right away, stop petting her. That's too submissive. And if you're petting her and she puts her arm on the top of your arm, her paw on your arm, stop petting her as well. That's a dominance move. Um, so, I don't know what, that's a little jumping spider. It's a little jumping spider. It's a little jumping spider. Yeah. Yes. Well, we'll, 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 yep, there it is. Ew. There it is, right there. Oh, gosh. Get her. Rosie, come here. Get it, get it, get it, get it, get it, get it. <laughs> All right. You can step on just, her. We'll just kill it. Yeah, yeah, spider kill it. Man. Okay. <laughs> now, if she is barking, remember, we can redirect her. If I give her this treat, I'm rewarding her. So I'm just trying to redirect her nose. Now I'm going to ask her to do something else because I've got at least three seconds of no barking. Sit. Sit. Remember, anytime you give a treat, they should hear the command immediately afterwards. So I've stopped her from whatever it was she was she was working on. Sit and redirect her towards something else. Um, okay. So uh, the things that I uh, the watchwords. The watchwords, and we'll go ahead and we'll do this. All right. So the watchwords are: if we come in the room and we suspect somebody's petting without a purpose, we say paycheck. That person stops petting. Sit. Remember, only ask once sit and then we stop petting we tell the dog to sit when it sits we pet on its chin and say sit and we tell the person hey i asked him to sit you just missed it um but we won't realize how often we do it without the right without the right context testify means the dog just did something that you, we can reward so the dog you say testify look at the dog and whatever the dog's doing at the time you pet it and, st and say if it's standing there you assume it just came to you if it's sitting pet it and say sit come uh, if it's laying down, say crash is the word I like to use. If it brings you a toy, name each toy. Every time it brings you the, uh, you know, the bear, say bear. And after a while, you can say bear, and the dog will go get you the bear. Um, let me see what else. Are you gonna pull it, pull it, pull it, or that's to mark where the spider is. Let's come over here. Um, let me see. The other one that I have is uh, repeat or rerun. If we're saying the same command word multiple times, um, and then what else? Um, I think those are the three. I, I, there, there's another one I can't remember what, what it is. Um, I also showed the guardian a couple exercises. We had a targeting exercise. Remember when you karate chop, keep it close to the dog and it move only one inch away each time. But if you move it too far away and the dog doesn't, then move it back, uh, always back up a step and help the dog practice that step a couple more times before you get the next one. Don't karate chop like this. Karate chop it a little bit by diagonal. And once I karate chop, don't move that hand. When the dog comes to it, I move the treat to where that is. And we're going to say the word target every time the treat goes in the dog's mouth. Eventually, you want to get to the point where you hold your hand like this and the dog will come over to it and stick its nose on, on your hand. I also showed the guardian a focus exercise, which is a great way to get the dog to look at you in the face. Remember, at first, it's one second to raise it to your nose and then one second in the dog's mouth. Eventually, it's one second and then 15 seconds. And make sure that you can see the treat and the dog's eyes the whole time you're delivering it. So always raise it to your nose first and then go to the dog. If you can't remember how to do either one of those, message me. I have a bunch of videos I've done with other clients I can share with you. Now, um, most of the time I only need one session to help dog fix dog problems. She is so uh, insecure and nervous, we may need to do a follow-up session and we won't know. The guardian's going on vacation, like I said, in two weeks and she's gonna spend a week or two at a place and when she comes back, I want you to spend a full month working on all this stuff. So when you get back from your vacation, Put in your calendar, re-watch these, both these videos and start working on all these techniques and message me if you have any questions. If I don't hear from you, I assume everything's great. I give every client my personal cell phone number and tell them I want them to call me. Sit, she just sat on her own, I gotta reward that. And so, uh, but if I don't hear from you, I assume everything's going great. Uh, now after, uh, when, you, when you get back from your vacation, if it's two or three weeks in and you're frustrated or whatever, give me a call and we'll set up a one hour follow-up session if we need to. Um, now, uh, she is actually, there's somebody I met, I worked with, uh, her name's Wendy Pete, and she doesn't really have a rescue, I guess she has a rescue, I don't know what the name of it is, 
But uh, basically, she just goes to South Dakota and grabs dogs off the reservation. And Wendy makes a lot of sacrifices for her dogs. And so I'm going to uh, make sure that I tag uh, uh, Wendy on this post and uh, to give her a little bit of recognition because she saved this dog uh, whose, whose mother was pregnant when she saved her. And uh, so, uh, you know, Wendy, thank you very much for saving the dog. Um, and if you're going to get a dog, make sure you don't shop, adopt. Get either a dog from a breeder or preferably from a rescue group like Wendy or somebody who just goes out and looks for, out for dogs. There's great dogs out there. She's a great dog. She's just a little bit confused as to where her position is. Come. Got a little water. Can I can give her a little bark for the road. Um, let me see. What else. Is there anything else I forgot? Direct eye contact for your guests. Remember, she's an eye contact dog. All right, we're gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm just doing this to distract her. Remember, uh, well, this is, um, before I say that, this is, uh, why, 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 your name already? This is Lucy. This is uh, Rosie. Rosie. See, I, 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 I remember the whole rest of the setup. This is Rosie. This is Rosie's roadmap to success. Remember, everything you do changes. Let me try that one. Let's do it with a treat. And she's a little bit tired because it's been three hours. Yeah. Sit. Good, just sit, Lucy. Try not to say good sit. This is Lucy. This is Rosie. Her, Rosie. This is her roadmap <laughs> to success. It's been a long week for me. Mm -hmm. Remember, everything you do trains your dog. Only sometimes you mean it. Mm -hmm.